Hey Rovers, a lot happened on Wave Rover the weekend of my birthday. It was a whirlwind of activity. The Wave Rover 650, a design based on my single-handed ocean voyages. She's small, light, but easy to build and strong enough to cross any ocean. My name's Alan Mulholland and this is the Wave Rover story. Well, recently I celebrated my birthday, uh, 59th birthday, and as I get closer to launch, I actually feel like I'm getting younger. You know, I'm, I'm really energized. Now, during the birthday weekend, I had my uh, very good friend and the very talented Stephen Marinelli come from the next province over to be a Rover's house guest. He was here for four days and we got an amazing amount of work done. You know, Stephen, of course, with the amazing Mrs. Rover, uh, we put together an amazing team and got a lot done. So let's turn the clock back and take a look at what happened. Yeah, so uh, what we're doing right now is we're going to be putting a flat piece of plywood across here and then there'll be little openings in it you know that you can stuff stuff into but uh the real reason for this is you know when you're sleeping in this bunk and this is the uh, leeward side you're just going to roll into these torturous ring frames and not get a proper sleep so um, by putting something flat here you'll have something solid to roll into and it's going to not that we need to stiffen these up, but, you know, it'll have some structural benefit and, uh, of course, storage. Yet more storage, as though there's not enough storage. There is so much storage on this boat. Um, just pan over there. The floor now has, uh, has heaps of storage, and there's heaps of storage under all the bunks, and there's heaps of storage up forward in the mass compartment. And back aft here, you know, in the tiller flats, we have just so much space. Um, we have to be careful, we can't fill this whole space because we'll sink the boat that has so much uh, capacity for cargo. Anyway, that's, uh, that's the next plan is we're going to scribe this, uh, find out what the curve is, and then apply that to the ply, uh, apply those measurements to the ply, and uh, yeah, get on with it. Time to crack on. So this is really light ply. This is quarter inch ply and we wanted to cross cutting and cross cutting is always difficult because you end up with tear out, if you can see that. But this is actually our waist side. On this side I used a knife to score a line. You've seen me do that many times in the past but it's such a, a good thing when you consider the price of ply not to mess it up. Uh, this is still usable. We'll, we'll need smaller pieces later on but this is what we're after. So. Mrs. Rover, what are you doing today? I am pressure canning some stew for Alan to take with him on his trip. I've got uh, 16 half liter jars in here of ground beef, carrots, turnips, all mixed together. And we're going to cook that at 11, oh, actually it's a little high, I'll turn it down, for 75 minutes. This is the first time I've used the pressure canner on the new stove, but it seems to be working great. Now, just to clarify, uh, we have two different types of canners. We have this one, which is a uh, kind of a sophisticated version uh, that we use for doing meats because it has a different pressure than the other canner we have, which, what's it used for? Oh, we can use it for salsa or canning tomatoes, any kind of vegetables, yeah. but something that doesn't need pressure like this, not pressure canning. Right, right. So that's it. So Wave Rover, if you remember the original Wave Rover, I had 60, uh, I think there were one liter jars of stews and chilies that were made by Mrs. Rover and I would have them every few days when at sea. So it's a real treat to have good quality uh, food because you can always buy soups and uh, chilies in cans, but I find they're just so over salted and contain other things that are unmentionable. So this will be just pure and good quality local food uh, turned into a stew that I can take anywhere with me. Nice. So, 
operation complete. That's all the, uh, the little fillets. Yeah. This one, this one's good. That's what we want. But these ones, we'll just have to chisel those square. Uh, this is a huge one, and yeah. that one as well. Nice job. It's <laughs> beautiful. It doesn't, doesn't suit what we're doing right now. Yeah, it doesn't give it the fairness that you need. Okay. And this side over here, um, yeah, it needs the same thing. So why don't we just grab a couple of chisels and uh, get stuck into that. All right, we'll clean those up and get ready. Uh, I just want to go over proper chisel techniques. So when you go to use a chisel, you've got this bevel on it. And a lot of folks would maybe attempt to do that and start hitting the chisel. What will happen is this sharp edge will just dive into the wood and you'll take a big divot out. So the proper way to chisel is with the bevel down and you get the angle to the surface and you knock the chisel forward. So it'd be like this. And I'm not diving into the wood. I'm taking out that nice piece right there of, of fillet material. But I haven't damaged the plywood underneath. And then when you go to do the vertical cut, same thing. Keep the, keep the bevel in line with your structure. And come back just like that. No time you'll be an expert. Time to crack on. Time to crack on. Oh, stepping in a bite. Good thing we're not at sea. Okay, so let's put this over. Okay, before you start that, did you hear about the new Navy recruitment program? The yeah. NEP? Yeah. Oh, what? oh one, sorry. One year, you join, essentially, is it, yeah. it sounds like you're an OSUT for a year. Yeah. And then if you want to then join on. I thought, brilliant idea. Did you see the age? 57. 57. All right, he's going to sign up. I, I missed it, unfortunately, by two years, but I would, I, I, so I thought, 57. 57. Why didn't they come up with that like three years ago? And I, I would well, have signed thinking, up for a year. Who's the idiot that came up with that age? Uh, because 57, you're 58, but when you're done your year, yeah. oh, you can officially retire in yeah. two years. Yeah. It's like, wait, but you're, it's a three-year initial commitment after that. So you can retire before your BE is over. <laughs> hey, listen, we're not, there's no ageism in the Canadian Armed Forces. Yeah. Do you want to do basic at this age? <laughs> it was tough enough when I was 18. <laughs> exactly. What's the weather like outside? <laughs> the weather outside is frightful, but the beer will be delightful. ...system on the saw, and then the saw steers it. It's the same AI technology that Elon Musk uh, developed for his Lasers. car. Lasers. <laughs> that ensures the cuts are super straight. Hey Rovers, today is April 9th and it's my birthday. And what am I doing on my birthday? I am working on Wave Rover. So we're working on the skag today. So the skag is basically these lines right here. So I've got a baseline, it's an inch up from the edge and this is the trailing edge of the skag and this is the leading edge and it comes up to here. 
And this is the original skeg that you'll see in the drawing because it's made out of a steel structure. But we're making this out of plywood, so we have to make the skeg a little bit bigger so it's coming up to here and here because the skeg uh, has to be inside the boat and we have to be able to give it some sort of um, stability you know when pressure loads the side of it so that's what this extra height is for and that will then be distributed to the side all this will make sense when i actually do it so to give ourselves a nice bit of comfort when we're gluing this up i have lines that extend an inch and a quarter beyond all the actual edges that we need so that when we glue it, we, uh, we can you know, drive a fastener through there. We have ourselves a bit of leeway if something slips and we will keep this on top with all of our exact lines and we'll be able to trim uh, the three laminations. I should have said that at the beginning, the skeg will be three laminations thick, which three eighths ply adds up to an inch and an eighth. Anyway, time to crack on with the actual cutting. We have our glue nicely distributed on what is going to be the third lamination. So uh, that's that's a nice distribution, and and it's not thick. It's not overly thick. It's just the right consistency for the glue. Okay. And and all the pieces were thoroughly wetted out prior to. And if you look carefully, you will see. This piece of plywood used to be our storyboard for the hatch housing, and now it's getting repurposed as the skag. And something we can go over, oh yeah, and this is interesting too. Um, so this piece right here, we made sure this is what we drew. This is our storyboard for the skag itself. So I've got the skag, that's the top of the skag. Here's the... Uh, transom edge of the skeg and here is where the skeg leads leaves the bottom of the boat and this line is the leading edge of the skeg so uh, we just need to laminate these together and then uh, after they're fully cured just cut back to our lines okay we're good So we're just taking a few moments right now to do a little bit of planning because uh, things are moving pretty fast and I have to. So I need to get the inside figured out. And one of the things about the inside is we need to figure out the electrical panel and it's going to be in the nav station. So what we're looking at here is on this piece of plywood, my pencil line indicates the space and it's a big space that we can use for the, for the electrical stuff. So this this right here, this Vitron energy um, meter will give me all the information about the charging of my battery and uh, the MPPT, I believe. And I still have to do a lot of learning on what it can do, but it gives me a lot of information. This will be where the switches are. So you can imagine there's a switch for uh, the nav lights, another one for VHF and so on. You know, right across, I have eight eight circuits total and they all have the blade style uh, uh, blade style fuse you know which are really easy to get and that was one of the decisions we went through what type of fuse do we want to put in this stuff well the blade fuses are really really uh, you can get them just about anywhere they're used in automotives they're used on, on panels like this so because of that and they're inexpensive you know I can just put a few into a into a bag and uh, you know suck the air out of the bag and and just put them in storage and if I lose a fuse it'd be very easy to replace so uh, that's the that's the fuse panel and then these these are um, this style of receptacle and so I'll put two of those on the panel but as you can see I've got a lot of space we also have 
I'll just show you the box. So we also have different styles. So we'll put a couple of these on as well. So we'll end up with four of these items going across here. Oops. So uh, those, uh, those will not be all the receptacles. We also will have receptacles over on the other side of the boat. So this is on the nav station. I do want to have a couple of receptacles over on the port bunk. And then this little USB-C is a, is a hardwire version. So this would be mounted on the back side of this, this panel material and then there would be a little hole drilled for this wire to come through. So all you would see really would be this wire coming through and it'd be coming through approximately like this and that's for my uh, tablet to plug into. So I'll have a really nice uh, sort of system to keep my tablet. In fact, I may even have a second one of these because the same connector can be used for my inReach and I can have both of those mounted really on the uh, watertight bulkhead adjacent to this. And then on top of this panel, I've got a lot of space still to the, uh, to the top of the cabin. And I believe I have room to mount my VHF. I'll be taking that out later. But you're probably saying, wow, Alan, even if you add two more of these, you've got heaps of room. And that's great. You know, I, I like that because you don't have to fill it all. But if at some point we need uh, to change something up or add something, we've got plenty of room. And that's what I'm thinking about. So this, this will be mounted, but not permanently mounted. This will be mounted just with screws, with uh, cup washers, so that if we do have to change anything, we just undo those screws, pull the panel out a bit. We'll make sure there's enough wire in there that it's movable and then we can change something up. Underneath, and there's a counter of course right here, and underneath that counter, we're going to have our big uh, isolation switch and the batteries and the uh, controller and all that other uh, information that goes with, with, the, uh, with the electrical. But we are keeping this really simple and that's important. But at the same point, uh, the reason we even pull this out right now is to make sure that the space we have fits and it does, you know, with, with lots of room. Time to crack on with a little bit of boat building now. Are you using your hands to see, Alan? Yeah. There's too much dust on my glasses. Use your hands to see. There we go. It's looking good. Very fair. And this is just the rough, uh, the rough uh, chine work right now. Yep. And the finish work is to come yet. Right on. Time to crack on.
Okay, we've got the boat more or less prepped. It's been sanded, it's been cleaned. Shop hasn't been this clean in a long, long time. Steven's here and Steven's putting an index line on because we're going to be glassing right away. And what's going to happen is the biaxial glass is going to go from here up and over. So it's going to be 10 inches wide in total, five inches either side. We're going to do this entire seam along here all the way to the end of the cabin. And then we're also going to do this entire seam and we're going to do that on both sides of the boat. But the boat has been prepped for all the glass and uh, it's, a, it's going to be a multi-day multi, multi -day process. We did have a, a little bit of fairing to do on the cabin top, not a whole lot. As you can see right there, this big uh, white patch, uh, that's been fared out now. And over on this side, similar sort of uh, setup. But really, I mean, the boat looks really, really good. I mean, I know that someone could take a lot more time and make this perfect. But this boat, in my eyes, is perfect for me. And what are we doing here? We're putting the 18 ounce biaxle fiberglass over top of these joints. We've done the other side already. We've all hands on deck. This is looking really good. And then we'll be putting the peel ply up top. Great. Hang on a second there, buddy. So we'll, uh, we'll just keep that half inch, buddy. I'm going to pull it up to the shape of the hole here. Okay. It's going to be a little higher there on the side, just the way that. Geometry of the curvature. Okay, let's grab the uh, scissors. We'll make a little incision right there. Okay, excuse me. Uh, a little dirt in here. The peel file lays flat. Reorganizing this space with Stephen over the birthday weekend was a great move. It allowed us to be really, really productive. And just to show how productive, Stephen being a flight engineer had a checklist. And this is what we got accomplished. A ton of stuff. So this is the state of wave rover right now. Um, all the fillets have been done on uh, on the whole exterior. This face needs to be glassed. Um, that's what I'll be doing this afternoon. And all the, all the edges have received their heavy biaxial glass. So here, here, of course, along here. The face of the cabin up here, this has all been glassed along with... Uh, you know, the fillet is in there. Of course, the deck uh, edge, that all has the heavy biaxial. 
but probably one of the most time consuming jobs and it's now done thankfully uh, all the fillets around the edge of the hatch uh, opening or hatch housing rather have been completed and it is totally glassed including the hatch itself and this bulkhead right here the aft end of the cabin that's been fully glassed and all the important joints for example between here and here that has heavy biaxial uh, these edges right here have received uh, 10 ounce tape and then of course 10 ounce cloth has gone over top of everything it still needs to be ground down but that more or less completes the tricky bits of the fiberglass now what what's remaining uh, and we hope to get this done the next week or so is to get the glass over top of the flat areas it's uh, really straightforward compared to glassing around structures like this and making sure everything will drain properly and you know looks good so it's uh, it, it's terrific you know that we have these temperatures now that allow me to get this kind of production done but I'm not doing it by myself I do have help you know I have uh, my friend Bill England he's been dropping by of course the amazing Mrs. Rover uh, she's here to help uh, mix up the the epoxy and um, yeah it's uh, probably the biggest help I have is the temperature you know I'm no longer wearing a jacket and a toque to get the work done Well, with the temperatures warming by the day, production is really increasing. Things are moving pretty fast on the boat building front. Uh, but of course, the days to launch, which is uh, July 8th is the scheduled launch day. It's approaching very fast as well. Now, just to uh, keep everybody in the loop, I've decided that every Friday video, I will have a little boat tour just so you can see exactly where we are in real time uh, to help you get a perspective of, uh, you know, what's been done and what needs to be done. As always, Rovers, forge your own adventure. Well, the Wave Rover patrons, with their pledges of support, really do make the creation of these videos possible. Now, if you'd like to know more about Wave Rover's patron page and Benefactor's Bulkhead, I have links to both those pages in the video description. Now, another way to help Wave Rover, and it doesn't cost you a dime, is by sharing our content on your social media. So now, as always, Rovers, thanks for watching. one more. Brilliant.